Good morning, family. You know, a lot of us go through life developing filters. We learn to monitor our behavior in order to function in life, don't we? You know, with this group over here, if we want to be over here with our friends, our filter's kind of like this. But then we're getting ready to go to church on Sunday morning, boy, that filter tightens down, right? Getting ready to go because we got to make sure that stuff doesn't come out of that filter. But what happens as we're going through our daily lives when stuff, when, when a hole pops up in that filter and something comes out? I know you've never had this probably happen to you, but I've had it happen to me plenty of times. You ever have something just pop out of your mouth and you go, where did that come from? Well, I'm going to tell you where that comes from, because Jesus tells us that it comes from our heart. We can try to monitor our filter system, but all that is is a filter system. We can try to maintain that filter system and work really diligently on making that filter system so nothing ever slips out, but we're really not going to the root of the matter, are we? In Matthew 15, verses, starting with verse 18, you know, Jesus just got through with that statement <clears throat> that the Pharisees took offense to, and, and then Peter replied, you need to explain this parable to us because it just made the, the Pharisees mad. And he says, are you still lacking in understanding, he asked? Don't you realize that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated but that what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a man. You see, I'm here before you saying that because we're at the heart, everything comes out of the heart. That's the place where all life emanates. That we shouldn't work so diligently on our filter system, we should look more honestly into our hearts. Jesus goes on in verse 19. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, blasphemies, and these are the things that defile a man. You see, it's the heart. So we tend to monitor and maintain that filter system, but we never really look at monitoring our hearts. And until we learn to deal with our hearts, all we have is a filter. And a faulty filter at that, because sooner or later, the filter's going to spring a leak, and something's going to come out of our mouth that we didn't want to. And what happens when it comes out of your mouth when when you don't want it to? Normally, it ends up hurting those that are around you, doesn't it? Normally, it hurts the people that you're in relationship with. You know Solomon, who was the most, the wisest man ever to walk the earth, they say, and he wrote so many books in the Old Testament You know, he wrote Proverbs, and he said in Proverbs 4.23, above everything else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. The Holman says, for from your heart springs all the issues of life. So what the wisest man in the world was saying, you know, I, I wrote Ecclesiastes, and I wrote Proverbs, and I wrote all that, all that aside, be diligent to guard your heart, from your heart is the wellspring of life. All of life, our words, our actions, our emotions, all that comes from our hearts. So we, be, we have to then be careful what goes in, and then we have to be able to keep a close eye on what comes out. Well, how do you monitor your heart, you ask? Because nobody ever told me how to monitor my heart. You read that in Proverbs 4.23, but how do I do that? How do I physically guard my heart? Well, we're going to talk about that today. Because today we're going to talk about four main issues, I believe, that will take root in our hearts and will eventually destroy our hearts, destroy our relationships, and destroy any kind of relational bond that we might have with those around us. It's a burden that we will carry. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a disease that we carry if we allow these four things to continue to grow within our hearts. But first, before we get to that, I want to ask you ten questions. Is everything okay in your heart today? Are you mad at somebody today? Have you had any extended conversations about a certain someone without that certain someone being present? Have you secretly celebrated somebody else's failure? Is there anything going on that you hope no one discovers in your life? 
Have you lied to somebody you care about? Are things coming out of your mouth that shouldn't be lately? Are you hiding something from people or from the world that you don't want them to find out? Are you carrying a past grudge or a past hurt or a past garbage with you? You see, Matthew 5.18 says, everything comes from the heart. So therefore, we live from our heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, we need to guard our heart. We need to protect our heart. We need to be diligent at that. But I want to share with you today, our care group's been studying this. And I think it was so helpful to me that I want to share this with you. I want to share you four major things that can take root in our heart that will end up destroying us and our relationships. But I don't want to just bring that up. I want to give you practical application of how to uproot those, how to get rid of them so that our hearts don't have to carry that burden, okay? Oftentimes, we get the guilt part, right? We get the conviction part, but I always appreciate when somebody gives me the practical application of how I can get rid of it in my heart. And that's what I hope to share with you today. You see, there's four things, there's four major things that if we allow to take root in our heart, will destroy us and our relationships. And that's guilt, that's jealousy, that's greed, and that's anger. Okay, and I want you, as we talk about these four things, I want you to think about it as a debt-debtor relationship, okay? Guilty. You know, when people think, think of guilt, sometimes for some people, the first thing that flashes in their mind is church, right? I mean, there have been churches that have leveraged guilt to get people to come back. But do you understand that Jesus never once, never one single time in the entire New Testament ever leveraged guilt for anything? He never, ever leveraged guilt. Okay, so guilt shouldn't be leveraged. Jesus didn't need to use it. So why do we use it? Why do we allow guilt to leverage us? Guilt becomes a heart issue, so get out of this. If you're, if you're in a situation, you're in a situation, you're in a relationship that they're leveraging guilt against you, that's unhealthy. You need to get out of that relationship. You just do. Because that guilt, that leverage of guilt will destroy you. Guilt's a disease. It's a monster. It's a problem that has to be done away with. Guilt says, I owe you, doesn't it? Doesn't guilt, I've done something to you and I feel guilty, so I owe you, right? Let's take it like this. Have you ever said, I owe you an apology? Why? Because I owe you. I've done something to you and I owe you an apology, right? Or had say, let me make this up to you. You see that debt debtor relationship? I've taken something from you or I've done something to you or I've harmed you and I need to give that back and I need to make restitution of that. Look at it this way. When you lie to your spouse, when you lie to your, your, your father or your mother, your husband, your wife, when you lie, you're robbing them of that pure relationship. Because lies bring in darkness, right? When you lied, if you, when you, if you ever lied to your spouse, have you ever felt guilty for lying? Why? Because you stole something from that person, haven't you? You've withheld that relationship, that part of that relationship from that person, and you feel guilty for that. You see, guilt causes that inequality. It causes those scales to be tipped out of balance. It's like a weight. A guilty person, I don't know if you've ever harbored guilt or ever hung, around, hung guilt around your neck and carried it. It's a burden. It's heavy. It's hard to carry, and it's hard to continue to deal with. And God says He doesn't want you to continue to deal with it. He didn't say it's His guilty practices that brings us to repentance. The Bible says it's His loving kindness that brings us to repentance. He doesn't want guilt to have power over us. You see, the weight of guilt, if you carry unresolved guilt, you'll carry it everywhere you go. You'll carry it into, you'll take the guilt from past relationships and you'll unwittingly carry them into future relationships. Therefore, robbing that future relationship of that perfect, wholesome harmony. And honestly, if you just unpack the guilt, there's just anger underneath, right? Right? And what's, what are you angry at? If I've hurt you and I feel guilty for that, where is that anger really pointed at? It's me, huh? I'm really, it turns out that I'm really angry at myself. And, and honestly, I don't know if you've ever been around somebody that leverages guilt on a regular basis, but you're never, ever going to be able to measure up to that person. If you harbor guilt and you keep that, you're never going to be able to measure up 
to somebody who carries guilt because of this. Because since I didn't live up to my own standards, and I didn't live up to my own expectations, therefore you won't be able to either. See how that works? Guilt thrives in the darkness where nobody can see it. But when light is brought into it and cast upon it, it goes away. And all of a sudden, guilt loses its power and loses its power over your heart. I'm going to give you some two ways to get rid of guilt if you're feeling guilty today. There's two ways. Number one, you've got to give back what you took. Okay? If you've hurt somebody, you need to give back to that person. You need to go to that person. You need to make amends. Two, you need to go to that person. You need to ask them to cancel your debt. A debt-debtor relationship, right? I'm guilty. That means I owe you something. I'm going to come to you. Confession, brothers and sisters, is the greatest power equalizer that we have at our disposal. When we keep guilt in the dark, Satan will use that and will leverage that against us and use that against us in our relationships. But as soon as we cast the light on it, we confess it into the open. You need to confess it to somebody, and you need to confess it probably to the person that you've wronged, okay? And in Numbers chapter 5, I want to tell you, clear back in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 5, verses 5 through 7, the Lord said this to Moses, tell the Israelites when a man or woman commits any sin against another, that person acts unfaithfully towards the Lord and is guilty. The person is to confess the sin he has committed, confession, he is to pay full compensation add a fifth of its value to it, and give it to the individual that he has wronged. You see, even clear back in the Old Testament, God says, in order to make it right, in order for to make this debt-debtor relationship and clear the ledger, this is what you need to do. If you have done something wrong to somebody else, this is what you need to do. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? Remember Zacchaeus was a little guy, and he really wanted to see Jesus, so he scurried up the sycamore tree because he couldn't see Jesus. And Jesus saw him and said, you just come on down here. Zacchaeus, remember? You come on down here. I want to come over to your house today. And then that made people mad, right? Because what was Zacchaeus? Remember what he did for a living? Tax collector. He was a tax collector. And I got to tell you, tax collectors were not held very fondly by people of that time, okay? They were like the dregs of society because they were, they were basically unholy people and they didn't care who they ripped off. They were equal opportunity ripper-offers, okay? <laughs> they didn't care, so they were disliked by everybody, right? So they thought, okay, Jesus is now going to come and have lunch with Zacchaeus as a tax collector. Oh, that can't happen. He's going to be with a sinner. Zacchaeus says, I want to change life. Zacchaeus says, if I've done anything wrong to anybody, I'm going to repay. If I've stolen anything from anybody, I'm going to give back. Multiple times more than I took from him, I'm going to give that all back. Plus, I'm going to give half of everything I own to the poor. And Jesus says, that's not enough. No, he didn't say that, did he? No. He says, salvation has come to your house today. You see, that debt-debtor relationship, he knew, about, he knew all about that. He knew the math that was involved in that. So what Zacchaeus knew is that he had to take that debt and he had to cancel it out. But he had to go back to the people that he had wronged. You want to get rid of guilt? You need to go back to the people that you've wronged. You've lied to your spouse. You need to go to your spouse. You need to confess that out loud. Bring it out into the light. And you need to ask your spouse, ask your mother and father, whoever you've wronged, to cancel that debt. Therefore, the guilt loses its power in your heart. And now I don't owe you anything because you've forgiven me. Okay, I want you to, the undertone of all four of these things is going to be forgiveness. In order to cancel this debt-debtor relationship, we have to be willing to forgive. Confess it to somebody. Ultimately, confess it to the person you've wronged and make restitution if possible, and that will break the power of guilt. Go to jealousy now, okay? Another biggie that if we allow jealousy or envy to wreak havoc in our heart and it takes root, it will destroy us and it will destroy our relationship. And honestly... When you think of jealousy, what do you think? You think like high school, junior high stuff. You know, he said, she said, you know, she's got a, or he, I always used to think, that guy's got a $100 pair of tennis shoes, and boy, I wish I had a $100 pair of tennis shoes. Well, he just comes from rich parents, and, and 
<laughs> that was the way I thought, you know. But then you have the high school gals, and you have that going back and forth. It's a high school thing, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> I wish it was. But all of us deal with a level of jealousy and envy. You ever had that person in your life where you just don't like them? There's just something about that person you just... I can't put a finger on it, but whenever I'm around that person, he just... I don't want to be a part of that person is probably envy or jealousy. Because the closer you get to them, the worse you feel about yourself. So therefore, you want to stay away from them, right? Have you ever said, well... If I ever had that much money, boy, I would sure treat people differently. If I had that much money, I sure would do stuff differently than they're doing with it. If I had a truck like that, I would certainly, you know, not treat it like that. I would take much better care of it. What is that? That's envy, right? That's envy. And you think, if I'm jealous and I'm envy of you, you're my problem, right? Right? If that were true, if that were true, that means if you are my problem, you would be the one to take care of my problem, right? You could fix my problem. But you, as my, the, the object of my envy or my jealousy, you cannot fix my problem because the problem is not you. The problem is my heart. Because I've allowed envy or jealousy in my heart, and it has nothing to do with you. It's a heart issue. You see that? So it really has nothing to do with the other person because the other person couldn't help me get rid of it, Right? So what are we saying? God, I, I really feel cheated. I really feel cheated. I, God, it just isn't fair, right? Have you ever thought that? You know, it just, I work just as hard as that guy at the office, and he got promoted and I didn't. I put in more hours than him. It's just not fair. You ever thought that? Have you ever taken that thought and you've gone on your knees and you've gone to God and said, God, I don't think you're fair? Have you ever done that? Because this is part of getting rid of envy and jealousy, okay? You're, I want you to get on your knees, and I want you to go before God, and I want you to say, God, you're not fair. You're not treating me fair. Because really, it's not the problem. I'm jealous for you having a nicer truck than me. It has nothing to do with you or the truck. It boils down to, I don't think God blessed me enough where I could have a new truck. Could it be that I feel that God ripped me off? Could it? You're jealous and envy? This person, God has blessed this person so richly, and me, nothing. I'm just as righteous as that person. See that where that, see where that root happens in the heart? You see that? But it has nothing to do with that. You think, God, you're unfair. You're unjust. I challenge you to go before God and say, I think you're unfair. He can handle it. Okay? He's a big God, and He can handle it. What you'll find when you go to the foot of the cross where fair is, right? Was it fair that Jesus Christ took a payment, took a debt of sin that he didn't owe? He didn't know. He never sinned. So why did he have to die on the cross of Calvary? When I went to God and I said, I don't think you're being fair with me, God, God says, I don't think you want fair. Do you really want fair? I got to thinking about that. I don't really want fair because I know me, and if it was fair that I got what I got, I wouldn't want to get what I wanted to get, would I? I mean, I wouldn't want that. What would be fair for me would not be good. Was it fair that Christ had to bear my sins on the cross of Calvary? No, but that's how God designed it. Fairness, God, there's nothing in the New Testament, the Old Testament that says God is fair. God is sovereign, right? God is sovereign. And I, and I, I love David. We're going to go into First Chronicles, okay? Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, and this David's prayer is an amazing prayer. Starting with verse 10, it says, Then David praised the Lord in the sight of all the assembly, and David said this, May you be praised, Lord God, our Father Israel, from eternity to eternity. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty, for everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Okay, he's head over all. David's realizing this, right? Riches and honor come from you, and you are the ruler of everything. Riches and honor, blessings are bestowed by God at his discretion, as he see fits, as he wills, as he wants. 
fair, he will send rain on the just and the unjust, won't he? He says, I will bless whom I choose to bless. He didn't say anything about fair. Power and might are in your hand, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. It all comes from Him. See, the real question is, I, you know, I think God owes me. But if you let envy and you let jealousy take root in your heart, think back to the love chapter for a minute, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Think about that, okay? Love is patient, love is kind, right? Love does not envy. You see, if we allow that, that, that root of envy and that root of jealousy to take hold in our hearts, we will never, ever, ever be able to love as God has commanded us to love. It will render us incapable of loving correctly. Love does not envy, yet love bears all. We can't bear all. We can't allow love to be perfect love like God has commanded us to love as long as we allow that root of jealousy that root of envy in our hearts. Do you ever have that time when, you know, that some person that you're kind of jealous of, you know, that, man, I really, Dwayne's new truck, I really just love that new truck of his, and I really wish I could afford a truck like that, but I couldn't. Apparently he can. God blesses him and doesn't want to bless me. You know, and the next week you hear poor Dwayne got wrecked his truck. Oh, I'm sorry he wrecked that brand new truck. Real sincere, right? What, that, see, that, come, that seed came from that, 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 that seed of envy and jealousy, right? How could I, as a Christian, who's supposed to love my brother and sister, almost celebrate him getting in an accident and destroying a brand new pickup truck? That one that I was jealous, that one that I was envious over. But you see how that goes? You know, your kids couldn't get into private school, but she, her kids did, you know, and if God, if you, you know, if you really would have treated me better, you would, might, you would have made my kids smarter, so they got in there. Oh, you tell me your kids didn't get in either? I'm sorry. <laughs> you say that, but you're kind of rejoicing in your heart. <laughs> they didn't get in either. What is that? You see how that goes to destroy? And you've all of a sudden, you've built that, that, that barrier between you and that person, right? That envy. Jealousy. It's, a, it, it's not a circumstantial problem. It doesn't have anything to do with the truck. It doesn't have anything to do with the school. It doesn't have anything to do with the job. It doesn't have anything to do with the house. It doesn't have anything to do with, anything to do with any of that. It's not circumstantial. It's from the heart. And that's where you have to go to uproot it. Okay? So how do we get rid of it? Here's three ways to get rid of jealousy and, 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 and envy. Okay? First of all, embrace the knowledge acknowledge on your knees that God owes me. He's a big God. Get on your knees and go before Him and say, I don't think this is fair. I think you owe me. Go to God. Say that. He'll talk back with you. He's not afraid of that statement whatsoever. Go to Him. Go to Him on your knees. Go to somebody else and confess that sin of jealousy. Own it. Take responsibility of it, okay? Own it. Realize it. Acknowledge it. It's part of your life. You don't want it a part of your heart. So therefore, I'm going to take my responsibility in that, and I'm going to uproot that. Okay? Confess it to somebody. Anybody. You can't just confess it to God. You need to confess it to somebody else. Bring it to the light. Remember in James? It says, confess your sins one to another, that you may be healed. Right? But probably you ought to go and you ought to confess that sin of envy and jealousy to the person that you're envious or jealous of, shouldn't you? Confess that sin to them, acknowledge your part in that, and ask them to cancel that debt. They cancel that debt, what are they doing? They're forgiving you, right? Ask them to cancel the debt. And here's how you can, here's, here's the workout portion, Okay? Those of you who work out, you know you got to continue to work them muscles out. Here's the workout portion. Every time something good happens in that person's life that you're envious or jealous of, every time it happens, you celebrate with them openly, loudly, out in the open, to them personally, to their face. You celebrate with them. They have a victory. You celebrate that. Because if you're celebrating with them, you're not being envious of them. You see that? 
When you're celebrating with them, envy has no place to take root. So physically, with your mouth, you need to celebrate the blessings that they have. Oh, Dwayne got a brand new pickup truck. I'm glad that he got a brand new pickup truck, and I'm glad nobody was hurt. Celebrate with him. After you've gone, and, after I've gone and said, Dwayne, I, I, I need your forgiveness because I've been envious of you. Envy and jealousy will destroy our relationships. Well, let's talk about greed for a minute, okay? Our heart and our possessions. Well, I. I, I, at first, I'm thinking, well, I'm not greedy. You know, I have seen greedy people in my life, but I, I really don't believe I'm greedy. Our heart and our possessions, it comes down to the fact of generosity or greed. Am I generous? Well, I could be more generous. Well, if I'm not, I'm greedy. When greed gets locked into our heart, it influences almost every purchase, every financial decision, every relationship, and it even will get to influence our kingdom decisions. And because of that, greed is not a financial issue at all. Everybody says greed is a financial issue. Wrong. Greed is a heart issue. Luke 12, 15. Go there with me. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. He told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Have you ever known somebody that all life was was accumulating stuff? And the more they accumulated stuff, the better they said their life was? I don't see that, okay? Because you, you accumulate more stuff, that means you're more responsible for more stuff. And the more stuff I get, the more responsibility I have. And then I got a place to have, my, I got to have a place to put my stuff. And if I get too much stuff for the place that I have for my stuff, then I have to go out and buy a bigger place to put more of my stuff. You see, it's a vicious circle. Then I'm, what am I living for? Am I living for the kingdom? No, I'm living so I could stuff my stuff into a bigger stuffing place. I've totally lost sight of the kingdom, haven't I? Because I've chased stuff. Abund- Jesus says right there, the abundance, the gathering of stuff is not life. Acquisition does not equal life. A definition of greed, if we wanted to look at it this way, if we prioritize stuff, if we are choosing stuff over people or over relationships, we're probably greedy. I mean, it's that simple, right? If we are prioritizing stuff, things, over people, over relationships, We're probably greedy. Compare this attitude with me for a minute. The attitude of spending, the attitude of giving, okay? I've never worried about or ever had any anxiety over money that I have given away. Have you ever had anxiety? Have you ever had worry over spending? Of course. I got to spend last couple of days in Casper with my son. And my son, if many of you don't know, he's working for the railroad up there. And that poor kid, I mean, he is working his, you know, his head off, and he is just working night and day and day and night, and he's putting all this money away, and he's not spending any money really, and he's just, he's socking it all away, and he says, you know what? I just kind of want to buy myself a little gift. I haven't spent any money. I've done really good with this. I would just like to buy myself a new gun. Dad, would you go and help me buy a new gun? I said, sure, let's go look. We go and he purchases a new gun, and it was I mean, the ink wasn't even dry. He hadn't even passed it forward to the guy yet, and the gun's sitting on the counter and everything. And he looks at me and says, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> you see, giving money away, you never have those thoughts, do you? But spending, you do. Have you ever bought some big purchase and you're thinking, oh, man, I hope my wife doesn't get it out. Or, oh, mm, oh I had buyer's remorse, right? Right? See, when you're giving, you never have that. You know, I give, I give money monthly to Brett and Evelyn, and I never once sit there and go, man I, man, I really hope that's really going to a good cause. I, I'm going to just worry all night. Do, you don't do that, do you? 
No. But if I'm spending money hand over fist, it tends to make me worry, right? You ever met a, a, a generously giving person that wasn't happy? <laughs> Think about that a minute. Have you ever? I don't believe that I can remember any generous giving, totally giving person that wasn't happy. You think there's a correlation there? Greed stifles our joy, yet when we give and we, we give generously, we get joy and we're happy. Okay, so what do you do? What does it look like? I'm in a financial bind here. I've, I've, got, I've got some characteristics of greed here. How do I physically get that root of greed out of my heart? And here's what I'm going to tell you. Percentage, priority, giving. You say, well, what is that? It's not spending. It's giving. Okay? Percentage, priority, giving. I didn't think I was greedy until one Sunday, towards the end of the month, the plate came around, and I got my check out of my wallet, and I put my check back in my wallet, and I slipped my wallet back in my pocket, and I just sat back down. Nobody saw that, right? Because towards the end of the month, it was really getting tight, and I thought, well, I could use that. That's greed, folks. Okay? I just put my priority over kingdom priority, didn't I? I just said, God, I'm more important than you, didn't I? I was greedy, and I thought, oh, I, I never would have thought I was greedy. Okay, so what do I do? Percentage, priority, giving. You choose a percentage, okay? When you're spending, what are you doing? All of that is the attention of your kingdom. You're bringing that all to your kingdom, right? Buying for you, right? Accumulating of stuff. I'm asking you to look at it a different way. Go away from your kingdom. Priority percentage giving. Sit down, look at your budget and say, I'm going to designate this percent and I'm going to make it a priority to give it away from me, away from my kingdom, outside of my kingdom. When you do that, that breaks that hold that greed has in our heart. Because now money does not have control over you, right? You're controlling it because you're making it a priority to give that away. And I would say, I want you to make it a priority to give to the church. You say, well, church is always asking for money. Then don't give it to the church. If you want to get rid of greed from your heart, give it away from you. Give it to a kingdom other than yourself. Prioritize that. And I'm not saying percentage like, no, 1%. <laughs> I can handle 1%. No, I'm saying sacrificially divide it up, put a big old whopping percentage on there, and purposely give it away. And that breaks the authority that greed has on your heart. The fourth one, and the most difficult one, I think, and the one that I've struggled with mostly in my life, is anger. I also believe that anger is the most devastating of them all. You ever had anybody, known anybody that carries anger with them? You ever been around them and you just walk away and you think, that's just an angry person, man, he's just, he's just an angry dude, because they've carried that. Because they've carried that. My father was an angry person. He was angry all the time. And that destroyed the relationship he had with his immediate family because we all thought it was our fault. It wasn't our fault. It was a heart issue. Here's the thing is, if you guys have been carrying anger, you don't have to carry it anymore. Anger isn't an issue of circumstances. It's not an issue of a person. It's not an issue of a thing. It's a heart issue. Ephesians chapter 4. And you guys have heard this a lot, especially when you're doing some marriage counseling. Um, Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 26. Now, this is what Paul writes. Be angry. Well, there you have it, right? Cool. Well, let's, let's do the rest of the sentence. Be angry and do not sin, period. Anger's going to happen, right? He's not saying, if anger ever happens to you, no. Anger's going to happen to you, so we need to deal with that as Christians. But it says, be angry, yet do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, and don't give the devil an opportunity. If we let the sun go down on our anger, if we continue to carry it from this season of life to this season of life and into this season of life, what we've in, in essence said, Satan, here's an open door into my heart. Please come in, 
take up residence and wreak complete havoc on me and every relationship that I want to be in from this point forward, please. Would anybody ever say that? No. But what Paul's writing here, we give the devil an opportunity when we refuse to deal with anger. Maybe it's just a little thing. Maybe it's not a great big anger. Maybe it's a little bit of anger. Maybe it was just a little, somebody said something this Sunday morning, and I took it the wrong way, and I think it hurt my heart a little bit, but I'm not going to say anything. It takes root right there in the heart. Next week, you know, the first thing that you're going to think of when you see that same person, you're going to think of that hurt that was undealt with that you just left sitting there. I'm not going to deal with it because it's really not that big a deal. It was because it just took up root in your heart. And what you just said was it was okay for that to take root in your heart, and it's okay for Satan to come in, move in, and wreak complete havoc between you and that person. That's putting it right out there, isn't it? Anger, when it's allowed to have it, will destroy relationships. Teresa Odiombo. I asked her if I could use this as an illustration. She came in and she put her heart out here to, she wanted to be part of the praise team. And she came up here and she sang. And we really would like, we really decided that we needed people to kind of sing with the accompaniment disc, you know. She came up here and she's got a beautiful voice. She came up here and sang a cappella. It was the most amazing, beautiful thing. But I went back to her and I said, well, because we've had everybody else do it with CDs, can you just do that because that's what we've asked everybody else to do? And she said, okay, well, we'll think about it. Well, she never came back, and she never came back. And I came back to her a little while later and asked her about it, and she never came back, and she never came back. You know what it was? Several weeks later, she came up to me and said, I need to talk to you. And I said, sure, what about? I've been harboring anger towards you because of that. And I don't want that between you and I. God does not want that between you and I. She says, I love you too much for that to take root. So I'm going to confess that to you and ask you for your forgiveness. You know what that did? That completely broke that stronghold. That anger was completely broken in Teresa. And it restored our relationship that was fractured because of that. That was between us. You don't need to carry your anger. If you carry your anger, this is why it's very personal to me, You carry your anger, you get hurt in childhood. And you're angry because you got hurt in childhood, so you carry that anger into adolescence. And you take that anger and it gets amplified and it gets fueled, and you take that anger and you go into young adulthood. And that anger stays there, and then you take it into adulthood. And then all of a sudden, in this season of life, in this adult season of life, I'm married. And now I'm married, and I'm treating my wife and my family that I love horribly because of my anger. Don't carry your anger from season to season to season, and here's why. Because once I got to this season, I had to look around me. What is causing me to be so angry? I could choose to blame anything in this season. Do you know the root of that was clear back here? It was clear back here. I was angry with my father. He hurt me. That debt-debtor relationship says, you owe me. You hurt me, and you owe me. And I carried that through season of life to season of life to season of life. It was a Saturday morning. We were cleaning the house one morning, all four of us, my son and my daughter and my wife. And we're cleaning, and Jared's, I don't know, he's nine or ten years old, and he's being a nine or ten-year-old boy, and he's doing his stuff. And I'm saying, we got stuff to do here. Quit messing around. Well, my anger escalated, and all of a sudden I was treating him just like my father treated me, belittling him and doing this. And I was mad. And he said, you get upstairs, and I've had it with you. And he said something else, you know, and back talk, and off we went. And I was, and April peeked around the corner and says, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm in the middle of something here. <laughs> Can I talk to you for a minute? I said, yeah. Went down there and said, if you don't figure out what's in your heart that's causing you to treat us this way, I'm going to have to protect my kids from you. I can't allow you to treat my kids that way. They're not the ones you're angry at. She was right. 
I spent a lot of time talking with Roger trying to figure out what you're angry at may not be in this season of life. But I'll challenge you, ask the same question, what are you angry with in this season or even this season of life? Where are you carrying that from? You don't need to carry that burden of anger anymore. It'll come out sideways and it will destroy your relationships. Get rid of it. You don't have to carry it. Don't harbor it. Decide to lay it down. We don't want to give the devil any opportunity, any more opportunity than he has. He has plenty of opportunity with me. Why would I want him open door through anger? Remember guilt, I owe you. Jealousy was God owes me, right? Greed said I owe me, right? Anger says you owe me. You've been hurt, and the person that hurt you took or robbed you of something. Anger, therefore, is not like an open book. It's not like an open account. The worst thing you can do to yourself is to allow the the sun to go down or this season to close on that anger. Not on the day, not or maybe on the season, but don't allow that because this season, my today, will be ultimately affected by the anger that I bring in from yesterday, won't it? Don't carry it. Verse 31. And here's where he starts to tell us how to get rid of it. All bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting, and slander must be removed from you along with all malice. Get rid of it. It says get rid of it. Must be removed. 32. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Teresa had to get to the point where she laid her anger down and forgave me. And then she came to me when in confession and she asked me to forgive her for the sin of anger that she had harbored towards me, thereby breaking that authority that it had on her and the junk that it held between us and as a relationship as a brother and sister. I will never forget that because she did what we're supposed to do. You see, look at it this way. God says if we want to be forgiven, we must do first what? Forgive, right? Just as God also forgave us in Christ Jesus, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. See, God chose to close that account on us. Christ didn't owe that price, but God said, I'm going to close that account because of the sacrifice that my son's going to take to Calvary. I'm going to close your sin account because of him, not because of you. I'm going to choose to close that sin account. You and I have to make this stand. We need to choose to close that account, not for the other person, but for us. You see? Here's three steps. Here's three steps. If you want to get anger out of you, if you find anger taking root in your heart, here's how we get rid of it. First of all, you need to take out a piece of paper. You need to identify who you're angry with. Who are you angry at? Write it down on a piece of paper, okay? Here's the thing. You might be tempted to look around in this season of life at this person, this person, this person, this person. Yeah, they're all in church today, and I'm angry with all of them. But if we were honest with ourselves and we looked at our hearts and we wanted to ask that question in this season and this season, I challenge you, ask that same question. What am I angry at? What am I mad at in this season of life? my adolescence or my young adulthood or my childhood. Who am I angry? It happened that I was angry with my father and it was coming out sideways in every relationship that I had from that point forward. It had nothing to do with Lauren and Jared and April. It had everything to do with unforgiveness in my heart. And it had nothing to do with my dad. He owed me, but it had nothing to do with him. It had me making the decision to close that account and forgive him. Not because he deserved it, because I deserved it. You know what unforgiveness is? You guys have heard this before. It's like, I'm wanting you to die, but I'm going to drink the rat poison. That makes no sense, right? I'm going to harbor unforgiveness, and it's going to destroy me. It doesn't, it's not going to do a thing to you, is it? So I choose. Who wronged me? Go back to all those different seasons. Who wronged me? Write it down. Okay, 
Step number two, decide what they owe you. What do they owe you? They owe you something because that's where the anger stems. Write it down. Write it down. What, is, what are you owed from that? Write it down. And when, if you don't know, you may have to sleep on it. You may have to pray about it. You may have to meditate upon it. it may, may take weeks. God will reveal to you in your heart what? I had to go to Roger, and April and I went, and he talked to me, and he, we delved into my past, and we figured out where all this was stemming from. He helped navigate. If you need someone to help navigate you, find that person to help you find that place where your anger starts. Write that down. What are you owed? And then have a ceremony. Stand up and choose before God and everybody to forgive and say, I'm going to close that account. It no longer has power over me. Make a ceremony of it. Burn it. Make a big old trash can in there and have a ceremonial burning. But just so you know that it's gone. It's done. It's done away with. Never to exist again because you're not going to allow it to control your life ever again. But that has to be a decision that you have to make. That's our responsibility. I had to make that decision to forgive my father regardless of him. You see, God wants us to have pure and holy relationships. He wants us to have life and life to the fullest. And when we carry that baggage and that garbage around with us, we cannot have life to the fullest. We just can't. But we also have responsibility to clean out the garbage that we've allowed to creep into our heart. It's not a one-time thing. Guys, I have to continue to do it day after day after day after day after day. I find those same feelings coming back, and I have to do that same thing. You have to be real enough with yourself to hey, take an inventory, look into your heart, and be real with yourself and say, that nasty stuff is there, and I don't want it there. Lord, help me. Take it out. Make the stand. I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to leave you with these questions. I'm going to ask you again. Is everything okay in your heart? Are you mad at somebody today? Have you had any extended conversations about somebody without that certain somebody being around? Have you secretly celebrated somebody else's failure? Is there anything going on in your life that you hope no one discovers? Have you lied to somebody that you care about? Are things coming from your mouth that shouldn't are you hiding something from people, your loved ones, or the world? And are you carrying past stuff? Today could be the day, the first day to wellness. You don't have to carry that stuff anymore. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us this time to share your word, the power of your spirit, the restoration that comes from being your children. Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit. And thank you that we can have pure hearts and clean hearts and hearts that are open, hearts that aren't burdened, hearts that are free to love. Lord, reveal to us anything that's in our hearts that would keep us from being true lovers of, like you've called us to be. Give us the courage to act on that. Give us the courage, Father, to make the stand that we don't want this stuff to root in our hearts anymore. But thank you for love, and thank you for grace, and thank you for mercy, and thanks most of all for Jesus Christ, who took our sin to the cross, who paid the price already for all of these sins. You see, we always think when we've been hurt that somebody ought to pay, and honestly, we don't have to look any further than the cross to see, Lord, that somebody has already paid, and it was Jesus. He's paid the debt in full. So in that, we ask forgiveness. And we ask for you to just search our hearts and show us that which you would like to root out. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.